Thank you. And thanks the organizer for their work and for bringing us all here. So uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory is interesting, of course, for its applications. Uh, for example, applications to statistical physics or to string theory. But it's also interesting methodologically because it was the, the first example of a quantum field theories that could be solved using the bootstrap method. And nowadays, we have applications to, of the bootstrap method to a higher dimensional CFT or even to non conformal theories. But it's, it can be useful to have these uh, two dimensional CFTs, which are in some cases even exactly solvable. So, in these lectures, I will give an introduction to two dimensional conformal field theory in the conformal bootstrap approach and focus on uh, two types of theories that have been exactly solved maybe the simplest non-trivial uh, CFTs, I mean minimal models, and Liouville theory. So I will not focus, uh, I will not follow the history of the subject, um, but I will um, give, um, well, I will try to do simple derivations. I will also state explicitly the, the axioms which underlie these derivations. So you should not misunderstand it as, a, as an attempt to be mathematically rigorous. It's just that stating the axioms is, can be clearer and can be helpful when you try to, to do generalizations. So let's start with uh, the Virasor algebra and its representations. Well, before that, I have to tell you why we're interested in the Virasor algebra. So we're interested in, in conformal field theory. Uh, so conformal transformations are transformations that preserve angles. Now, in the two-dimensional complex plane with a complex coordinate, uh, any holomorphic map preserves angles. So let's consider in particular an uh, infinitesimal holomorphic map. So that's z goes to z plus epsilon z to the n plus 1 for any integer n and a small epsilon. Well, the n plus 1 is, is here for convenience. It's really any integer. So now this map acts on functions of z through some differential operators that I will call ln. So ln is minus z to the n plus 1 d by dz. And these uh, differential operators form a, a Lie algebra. In particular, uh, they have commutation relations ln lm equals n minus m ln plus m. So this algebra is called the Witt algebra. Now it includes in particular a subalgebra, a SL2 subalgebra, uh, which is generated by the three generators L0, L1, L minus 1. And this uh, subalgebra can be identified with um, global conformal transformations. So here I have local conformal symmetry, uh, which is a generalization, if you want, of global conformal symmetry. And so this is, these are infinitesimal transformations, but the, um, um, the finite uh, global conformal transformations act on z as z goes to az plus b over cz plus d, where ad minus bc is not zero, a, B, C, D belong uh, to C. Okay, but let's, let's come back to the local transformations. So um, are we looking then for representations of the Witt algebra? Well, probably you guess that we, we have to do something else because I'm talking about the Virasor algebra in my title. So why the Virasor algebra? Well, because we are doing a quantum theory and uh, typically in quantum series, um, the, uh, the symmetry algebra acts projectively on the space of states, uh, which, uh, and the projective action of, of an algebra is equivalent to the action of the centrally extended algebra. So that's why we always have central extensions. So what, what is the central extension or what are the possible central extensions of the Witt algebra? Um, well, the, the, that's an exercise that's not trivial, but the, the answer is that uh, the Virasor algebra is the only central extension of the Witt algebra. And 
So its commutation relations are just these plus a central term. So now the generators of the viral algebra are called big L. And here are the commutation relations. And then I should add some, some central terms. So let's have a central generator one. Uh, one just commutes with everyone. And more or less, I'm, moreover, I'm assuming that, that one has, well, I, is always one in some uh, given conformal field theory. It has a constant value. But then here I can put uh, some coefficient, and it turns out that the only coefficient that I can have is of this type, c over 12, n, is n squared minus 1, delta n plus m0. So c is the central charge. It's a complex number. Well, 12 is a normalization coefficient. Okay. So therefore, we should, uh, we should look for representations of the Firasso algebra. Basically, the, the spectrum, the space of states of, of a conformal field theory, has to be a representation of the Virasor algebra. Um, and now the question is, which representation? Well, finding the spectrum is, is already a, 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 an important part of solving a conformal field theory. So I will not tell you exactly which representation, but I will start uh, restricting which type of representations we, we want to have. And that's the first axiom. So the, the space of state, the spectrum, uh, is a direct sum of irreducible representations. Well, by saying irreducible, I'm already, uh, that's already a restriction. That's not true in all uh, interesting conformal field series, but it will be true in these introductory lectures. So irreducible representations, uh, where the generator L0 of the virus algebra is diagonalizable. Well, now you could accuse me of, um, of being redundant, because if the representations are irreducible, then L0 is diagonalizable. But it's, it's better to state it uh, explicitly, I think. And um, L0 eigenvalues are bounded from below. So let me give some justification for this axiom, and in particular for focusing on, on this particular generator, L0. So why, why, why L0? Well, L0 um, it corresponds to the generator of dilations, uh, to this uh, small L0, the dilation generator of the VIT algebra. And uh, we, we want to interpret this as the, essentially the Hamiltonian of our theory. So if we, we, we want to interpret the radial coordinate as time, then L0 is the, is the Hamiltonian. So the eigenvalues of L0 are energies. And, well, that's a, a general physical requirement that energies are bounded from below, otherwise your uh, system is unstable. So um, now let's study these uh, this eigenvalues of L0. Now, let's, let's have an eigenvector. So let's, let me call V some eigenvector. And let's assume L0 V is delta V. So delta, the eigenvalue, is, is also called the conformal dimension. So what happens if I, if I consider another state, ln V? another state in the same representation. Well, it's a small calculation that L0 ln V is, well, commutator L0 ln V plus uh, ln L0 V. Well, the commutator L0 ln is minus n ln plus L0 V is delta V, so delta ln V. So we get delta minus n ln v. 
So therefore, ln v itself is again an eigenvector of L0, and its, its eigenvalue is now delta minus n. Its conformal dimension is lower. Okay, now, um, in principle, that looks problematic because n can be any integer, so if I start from some eigenvector, I could get arbitrarily low uh, conformal dimensions in, contrast, in contradiction to the, to the axiom that it should be bounded from below. So what happens? So let, let's, let's look at the eigenvector with the lowest um, eigenvalue now. With the lowest conformal dimension. Well, then Ln with a strictly positive n acting on this v must, must vanish. Otherwise, I would have an even lower dimension. Well, let me restate the condition that we have an eigenvector. Well, these two conditions are the definition of a primary state. So primary states will play important, an important role. I mean, we must have primary states in, in any representation that obeys our axiom. So now, once we have a primary state, well, we can't act on it with uh, positive modes, otherwise we get zero, but we can certainly act on it with negative modes, like L minus N. So with, let's, let's have N strictly positive now. Um, well, let me even add with many such modes, product of, of L minus Ni with strictly positive Ni. Um, so that, uh, that's now called the descendant state. Um, now, the, what is the... Uh, the conformal dimension of this descendant state. So let's act on it with, uh, well, let, let me just give the result. So the, its dimension, well, is delta plus the sum of the ni, because each time I act with L minus ni, the uh, dimension increases by ni. Okay. So are there questions at this point? Well, if there are no questions, let me uh, try to draw a picture of, of our representation. So I am starting with some uh, primary state V. Um, and I connect with L minus 1, and I just get L minus 1 V. I connect with L minus 2 to get another state L minus 2V. Well, I can act with L minus 1 again. That's L minus 1 squared V. Well, here I can also act with L minus 1 to get L minus 1 L minus 2V. Well, or I could even act with L minus 3 directly to get L minus 3V. So here I'm organizing these states by their level. So let me call n, so let me define a number n, the level, which is zero for the primary state, which is one here, two here, three here. So if you want, the level is just the sum of the ni. Well, let's stop at level three. So, um, did I really write all the possible states at level three? Well, the, why didn't I write L minus two V, for example? I mean, that's certainly, uh, sorry, L minus two, L minus one. I mean, that's certainly a, a state at, at level three. Well, I didn't write it because actually it's, it's linearly related to, to the states I already have. Uh, thanks to the commutation relation, L minus three equals 
L minus 1, L minus 2. So I don't, I don't need to write it. I mean, the level 3 is, has dimension 3, typically. Okay. Now, um, the question is, is whether, uh, sorry, um, now, let me, the, the, the primary state and all the descendant states um, span a, a representation of the Virasu algebra that, that is called the Verma module. So that's a definition. So V delta, the Verma module of dimension delta is spanned by, well, my primary state V and all these uh, product L minus Ni V. So here I just wrote the uh, states at the first three levels, but of course it, it goes on um, at, infinite, at infinite level below. Now the question is whether the Verma module is an irreducible representation, since, since we assume the representations were uh, irreducible. So now if um, if it was reducible. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes. Is it obvious that it exists for any delta? That you can always do this? Or um, something could go wrong? It, it's not completely obvious, but I can always do it. I'm, I'm just defining this, um, this space. And um, well, that's a representation of the Virasso algebra. So basically, what, what you have to show is that these states are linearly independent, but uh, I mean, in general, you, they are linearly independent. Yeah. Okay, so now, if, if V delta was reducible now, uh, then by definition of reducibility, uh, there should exist a non-trivial sub-representation. So there exists R, a sub-representation of the Verma module. Now, inside this sub-representation, L0 has still to be diagonalizable. And so our reasoning applies that there must exist a primary state in that sub-representation. So let me call it, uh, whatever, chi. But this primary state cannot coincide with the primary state uh, V that, that we already have. Because if, if it did, then it would, uh, it would actually, um, the sub-representation would be um, V delta itself. So since by, by definition R is different from V delta, this chi must differ from V. So chi must be not only a primary state, but also a descendant state. So chi is descendant. And by definition, uh, a state that is both primary and descendant is called a null vector, which, well, there is a synonym, a singular vector. So uh, therefore, to know if our representation uh, of Verma module is irreducible, we have to determine whether it has null vectors. Okay, okay so le let's, let's now um, look for null vectors, unless we have a question. Yes? Um, no, well, I didn't define the norm so far, and actually I will never define the norm. So it, at the moment, it's purely a, an algebraic question. Yes. 
Okay, so um, where do we look for null vectors? Well, by definition, null vectors are descendant states, so uh, we can start looking at level one descendant states, and then we'll have to do it for all the levels in principle, but let's start with level one. So let, let me assume that chi, well, let me not assume, but let me consider some level one state and find out if it's a null vector. So let's act with ln on this uh, level one state. So ln L minus one V. Well, let's use the commutator, ln L minus one V plus L minus one ln V. So ln L minus one is uh, uh, minus N minus one, um, uh, L, L, no, it's L plus one here. Well, plus L minus one L and V. So, okay, so what happens now? If N is greater than two, so if N is greater than two, well, this uh, index is strictly positive and this one is also strictly positive. So since V is itself a primary state, it has to vanish. Uh, n greater than, greater or equal to two, sorry. Now, if n equals one, if n equals one, um, well, sorry, there's no minus here, I think. So ln L1 chi is two L0 chi. This term again vanishes if n equals one, and that's uh, two delta chi. So, uh, therefore, for chi to be a null vector, we need this delta to vanish. Well, that's even an equivalence. Chi is a null vector if and only if delta is zero. So this tells us that the Verma module V0 with conformal dimension zero is reducible. Uh, since it has a null vector. On the other hand, for if delta is not zero, V delta, well, we don't yet know because we have studied the null vectors just at level one. So let's study null vectors at level two now. So um, let's write a generic state at level two, chi equals L minus one squared plus A L minus two V. So, uh, what is the condition for this chi uh, to be a null vector? So again, it has to be killed by ln with n strictly uh, positive. Well, actually, we can. We just need to focus on L1 chi and L2 chi because for the because L3 would. Uh, would bring us to level minus one where there is nothing. So, of course, L, L3 or higher acting on chi have to vanish because V is itself a, a primary state. So we have to compute L1 chi and L2 chi. So uh, L1 chi, well, that's an exercise, but um, L, so L1 chi has to be a state at level, uh, at level one. So it has to be something times L minus one V, since L minus one V is the basis of the level one. And it turns out that the coefficient, if you do the calculation, uh, should be four delta plus two uh, plus three uh, A. And L two chi, well, L2 moves, moves us up two levels, so we end up at level zero. We must have something proportional to V. Now, what, what's the coefficient? Well, uh, the coefficient turns out to be three delta uh, plus, well, the, the, the coefficient that comes with in front of A uh, originates from taking L2 acting on this on this term here. So we have to take the commutator of L2 with L minus two. 
Well, the commutator of L2 is L minus 2 is actually uh, 4 L0 plus C over 2. So it depends on the central charge now. And therefore, here we get 4 delta plus C over 2. OK, so for it to be a null vector, these two numbers must both vanish, um, which will determine the coefficient a, but which will again determine the conformal dimension delta. And uh, the, uh, the, the conformal dimension that make it vanish are the following. Delta plus or minus is 5 minus c plus or minus square root c minus 1, c minus 25 over 16. Yeah. So at level 1, the condition was simple enough, just delta equals 0. But at level 2, we find two solutions, actually. And they are uh, more complicated. Yeah, other questions? Yes? OK, so the question is why I can do it level by level. Well, the, the answer is because L0 is diagonalizable, essentially. And uh, yeah, this implies that if, in any sub-representations, actually, it, it is again diagonalizable. So this allows me to, to do things level by level. OK. Uh, so now, um, le let me. Let me add some aesthetic concern. I mean, this formula is ugly because it's too complicated. Well, of course, if I told you that after we, after we see Liouville theory with all its uh, ugly special functions, uh, you would probably uh, not trust me. But um, for the moment, let's say the square root is, is the most complicated function we have seen. And, and it, not only it's complicated, but it, it's not single valued. So it has branch cuts. And, so let's eliminate the branch cuts by doing some uh, change of variables. Uh, basically, I want to reparameterize the conformal dimension and the central charge so that this formula uh, becomes simpler. So let me introduce a parameter called Q for the central charge. So Q is called the background charge. And actually, I will introduce a, a, a second parameter for the central charge. Uh, that's B now. B is the coupling constant. Well, these parameters are, are not defined uh, uniquely. Um, for a given value of C, we have two values of Q. We can do Q to the goes to minus Q. And for a given value of Q, we have two values of B because we can always invert B. And now for delta itself, let's write delta equals Q squared over 4 minus P squared, where P is called the momentum. OK, so this, this momentum is here. Well, this square is here to get, a, get rid of this square root, essentially. So do, that, does it work? I mean, well, yes, of course. So the, the p plus minus now, which correspond to this delta plus minus, uh, in terms of, this, of these variables, become 1 half of b plus b minus 1 plus b plus minus 1. So they are reasonably simple expressions in terms of B. So the, therefore, uh, the outcome is that the Verma modules with dimensions delta plus minus are reducible. And sometimes I can write the Verma modules as labeled by the dimensions, if you want. And the, of course, the conclusion is the same. We have this reducible Verma modules. So 
now let me summarize the results for the reducibility of, of Verma modules by looking at null vectors at level one, level one and two. So let's, uh, let n be the level. So at level one, um, we found uh, a, a momentum p uh, such that we, the Verma module becomes reducible, and this p is just actually b plus b minus 1 over 2. And then we find a null vector. Well, the null vector is just L minus 1 v. So let me write it just as L minus 1, the, the creation mode that brings us to the, to the null vector. Can you write this as a key Ah, OK. Yes, let's write bigger. So at level two now, we have two possibilities. So we have a P, which is B plus 2B minus 1 over 2, and a P, which is 2B plus B minus 1 over 2. And the corresponding uh, null vectors, well, I didn't compute them, but I give you the answer. Here it's L minus 1 squared plus B squared uh, L minus 2. And here it would be L minus 1 squared plus b minus 2, l minus 2. And now, now I'm about to give you the, the result for generic level uh, without doing the calculations. Uh, not because I can derive it at this moment. Uh, we'll have to accept it. I mean, we can derive it later when we, when we study fusion rules. But at the moment, let, let's, let's accept that at level n, um, the dimensions, uh, uh, the, Ver the Verma modules that are reducible are parameterized by factorizations of n in terms of two integers, two positive integers. So for any factorization, I have a momentum uh, that's 2R, uh, sorry, that's R B plus S B minus 1 over 2. And there is a corresponding null vector. Well, I will not write it. Actually, it's uh, not even known explicitly. It's L minus 1 to the Rs plus something. So this momentum, let's, let's call it PRS. Uh, this creation mode, let's call it LRS. And here, well, the labels for the null vectors, let's call them Rs. So here, that's 1, 1. Here, I have 1, 2, 2, 1, Rs. So the statement is that chi equals L Rs v is a null vector, a null vector of the Verma module uh, V, P, R, S. So now if, we, if you accept this result, uh, then we can answer the question whether the Verma module is reducible. And the answer is that it is irreducible if its uh, dimension is, is different from all these uh, uh, specific uh, dimensions. So V delta is irreducible if and only if delta is not of the type delta Rs for Rs uh, uh, positive integers. Well, delta Rs, of course, is the dimension that corresponds to the momentum PRs via this uh, relation. Uh, yes? Sorry, what values? What values can B take? Well, B can be any complex number. I mean, I, C, the, originally the central charge is, is any complex number. Uh, B, well, I, don't, I can't take B equals zero, actually. So you're right, I should have a restriction now. B should be non, a non-zero complex number. Okay, so, 
Okay, so now we, we know when the, when the representation is irreducible, but um, what happens when it's actually reducible? So let's consider the representation, the Verma module V delta RS. So th this one really is reducible. And what does it mean? It means it has a non-trivial sub-representation. And what is this sub-representation? Well, the sub-representation is, is the representation uh, generated by the null vector. So we have uh, a, re a sub representation R generated by the null vector chi. And R is a, a non trivial submodule of this V delta RS. So let me call this null vector chi RS, actually. But what is the structure of R? Well, this chi RS itself, by definition, is, is, is again a primary state. And in general, for generic values of the central charge, R is just another Verma module. It's a Verma module uh, whose dimension is delta RS plus R times S, because that's the dimension of, of this null vector. I mean, if you remember, this null vector has dimension, um, has level R, R times S, which means that its dimension is just the dimension of the primary plus, plus the level. So we have this, uh, this sub-representation. And actually, if we really want irreducible representations, what we can do is to mod out by this sub-representation. So we could define, uh, we could consider the, the coset V delta RS uh, modded out by V delta RS plus RS. So that's, let me call it R, RS. And this coset is called the degenerate representation. So that's a definition. And moreover, it is irreducible for generic central charges. Oh, well, of course, it cannot be irreducible uh, in general, because there could be an accident where I would have uh, some extra null vectors uh, lying around in, this, in these representations. But in general, I have just one uh, null vector in a given uh, Verma module. And in this case, this is a, a, an irreducible representation. OK, so that's what I want to say about uh, uh, Virasoro representations. And uh, after the break, we can start to do really uh, field theory. So are there any questions uh, before the break? Yes? Yes. So the question is whether this uh, sub-representation is, is always a Verma module or not. And indeed, there are other options because, um, well, no, sorry. No, there are, there are no other options. But it, usually, it has no null vectors. But it's, um, yes, I can always take um, uh, uh, this, um, this singular, this null vector is itself a primary state. And indeed, well, it's by definition R, if you want, is, um, is just the, what you obtain by applying these uh, creation modes on on this, uh, on this null vector, yes. So by definition, it's a Verma module, yes. Yes? So you mean, is, is, is there motivation for the central charge to be imaginary? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, most work in conformal field theory has focused on, on real central charges. And there are good reasons for that. I mean, only for real central charges, you can define a scalar product. Um, and in particular, all unitary uh, conformal field series will have real central charges. Uh, now, um, well, the imaginary central charges can be useful, I think, for two things. So first, uh, they can be useful as 
a kind of generalization. If you want, you, you can study uh, analytic properties of, of conformal field series with respect to the central charge, and sometimes it can help you even understand the real or the rational central charges. And the second uh, motivation would be um, to study specific CFTs that might have uh, uh, complex central charges, such as, for example, the two-dimensional POTS model. So th there was recently an article by um, Gorbenko, <coughs> Rishkov, and Zan, uh, where they take the uh, POTS model with a number of states bigger than four, and in this case, the central charge becomes complex. Yeah. Are there other questions? Well, if not, let, let's do the, the break.